now okay. the people will join. Over to you, Gashwatesh. Uh, so today's extreme pleasure to invite Dr. C. J. Reddy, and he has really agreed very promptly to our request to deliver this lecture. And uh, they were actually working on Mr. Pune Chandigarh. We all were having quite a bit of discussions regarding the fellowship of upgradation of our Bangalore chapter for quite some time. Then it was a I got some positive signal from Dr. Reddy also that he is making some similar kind of presentations at a lot of places. So I thought it's better that we invite him to deliver us and guide us also how to uh, proceed with this uh, program of fellowship upgradation in our Bangalore chapter as well. So finally, today is agreed and agreed to deliver the lecture. So I think I welcome all of you and I'll request uh, our Chair Puneet Mishra, uh, to I request him to uh, start the session as welcome address. Mr. Over to Puneet Mishra. Puneet ji, you can uh, Thank you, Dr. Gitar. I think uh, as per agenda, Dr. Bindu Madhava is supposed to talk. So, Dr. Bindu Madhava, Bangalore Sixth Chair, uh, you Ashutosh, can. I hope you have the agenda, no? I made. No, I think. I'm, I'll, I'll just see. <coughs> No issues, no issues. Let us go with okay. Dr. Bindu Madhav. Okay, no problem. Sorry for that. Yeah, so Mr. Bindu Madhav, sir. Dr. Bindu Madhav, yeah. please. Good evening, uh, one and all present here. I think uh, it's a good initiative, which uh, we have been, uh, this initiative has been taken, uh, I think, five years back uh, to make sure that in the Bangalore section, we sort of have a program called FINE, uh, that is the fellow identification and nomination exercise. Uh, which is a program, and uh, I think uh, this was uh, every year we have been uh, conducting this, and uh, I'm happy to invite, I mean, welcome all of you for this particular thing, especially the aspirants, fellow aspirants who are uh, present here. And uh, I'm happy to uh, announce that uh, this year we were able to get three fellows uh, for the Bangalore section. So I think uh, this particular exercise uh, gives us a good uh, platform because we are at section having 1003 uh, senior members as on today. So uh, it is uh, better that we hear from the person who is a part of the fellow committee who can guide us uh, how to sort of uh, write our proposals so that uh, it is in the lines of what is expected by the committee. Of course, uh, the presentation also becomes very important and uh, Already this out of 1003, I think to the best of my knowledge, more than 60 to 70 percent, 70 percent of people are the people who can sort of graduate into that particular thing, but uh, only we lack the presentation. So I think uh, it is apt that um, uh, the societies which take the lead because the societies uh, has to sort of um, nominate or uh, recommend the uh, fellow this one. And in Bangalore section, I think we have got a sufficiently good number of fellows uh, in totality, representing the wide spectrum of uh, societies which we represent. So I once again thank on behalf of the section, uh, CJ Reddy to accept this particular uh, invitation from our side and uh, try to sort of guide us how to take it forward. Thank you. Thanks for the organizing committee for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you and welcome. Um, now I'll request Mr. Puneet Mishra to give his opening remarks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kedar. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kedar and Dr. Chandrakant for uh, initiating this uh, uh, fine of this year. So just to give a context, uh, since 2014 onwards, we have initiated this fellow identification and nomination exercise. And almost every year as part of section initiative we do. So first year, in fact, we have invited the fellow committee chair that time. Dr. Panos himself was here and uh, 2014 was the golden jubilee year of the fellow uh, grade also. So in that context, he came to Bangalore and it was a physical event. Almost uh, uh, 75 to 80 prospective uh, senior members as well as who's who of Bangalore section they attended. And since then onwards, almost every year uh, we are conducting this uh, fine uh, 
uh, which we call it as acronym is fine fellow identification and nomination exercise and uh, under this uh, we have invited dr prasad kodali who is a very very senior member of uh, fellows committee i think from last to two to three decades he is continuously he is the only member who is continuing in the fellows committee that's what i heard and uh, then uh, we were having uh, fellows from our section also like professor hari and uh, uh, dr harista and uh, last year we had dr sudhakar rao uh, who was talking on uh, about the fellow identification and nomination exercise and this year we thought that let us have one of the very very prominent person of electromagnetics and antennas and microwave uh, so because of that uh, apmtt chapter of bangalore section has taken this initiative this year to conduct this fine uh, as part of uh, in association with ieee bangalore section and we are really honored to have dr cj reddy who is uh, now member of uh, fellows committee so i think uh, nothing better than the person who himself is part of this entire process i think he will be able to give us a very very uh, key uh, details which committee will be looking for because uh, in india as well as in bangalore there are several uh, i can say that uh, prominent people who deserve to be icsd fellow but because of not proper nomination package i think they are missing and uh, what we feel in bangalore as well as in india we are very modest in uh, highlighting our own achievements so that is another reason why the number of fellows are less uh, in india at least from 2014 onwards because of this fine bangalore section participation is increasing and members from bangalore section they are increasing uh, bit by bit and this year we got three fellows elevation and dr cj reddy may be happy to know that all the three fellows are from industry so that is another unique thing they are not from the academia because uh, uh, you may be most of the people tell that i to be being a academic oriented organization most of the elevations are happening from the academia because uh, in industry uh, we are not having sufficient uh, papers as well as uh, things to show that they deserve to be an fellow uh, but uh, because of this initiative uh, in last 6 uh, to 7 years uh, i think we have uh, elevated not less than 10 fellows in bangalore section but still this number is uh, less uh, because bangalore section member and above uh, membership is almost now 4000 So if we will go by the IEEE formula, that point one percent of the member should uh, should be IEEE fellow. So according to that also, we should be having at least forty fellows in Bangalore section, which is not the case. And I think after this three, we will be having twenty six fellows in Bangalore section, twenty six or twenty seven exact number. I have to check, but still we are far behind the forty. fellows which as per iprpli rule also we should be having this is uh, uh, that's what so uh, in my opinion it is uh, uh, our uh, bangalore section as well as chapter responsibility to identify encourage promote and support all the deserving individuals who can be elevated to an iprpli fellow just to give a context same beijing section who is also having almost uh, a membership similar to bangalore section they get minimum 20 to 30 fellows every year whereas we are getting one to three fellows every year so there is a quite um, a digital divide i can say it is there so more and more people are there from bangalore section it is going to help not only bangalore but india and uh, it is not that i am looking from the percentage point of view but uh, i know people in bangalore they are really doing world class activities as well as their contributions are not less than anybody else across globe so and they deserve to be an icsd fellow so uh, this is our small endeavor in helping 
those individuals uh, to create a platform where they can come and listen from the uh, I can say now guru of uh, this fellow elevation process. I know Dr. C.J. Reddy himself has supported many individuals and I don't want to name those people, but they all have been elevated and this year also, I think uh, he has made significant contribution in elevating one of the members who is in just 34 years and he has been now an IEEE -E fellow. So I just want to inform all the attendees, delegates of this uh, webinar that it is not the age, it is the technical contribution which matters. And if we will highlight those contributions properly, uh, definitely nobody can stop uh, because this is a very, very fair process which Dr. Reddy will explain in detail. And uh, from India as well as from Bangalore also, we can get several IEEE fellows. With this, I would like to welcome on behalf of the APMTT Bangalore chapter, as well as on my own behalf, Dr. C.J. Reddy, for joining us and agreeing to deliver this uh, very important uh, member, individual member benefit uh, webinar for our members. Thank you. Go ahead and present my presentation, Panit. No, I'll just now briefly introduce the speaker, and uh, then I'll over to Dr. Reddy. So I just like to uh, know everyone about our eminent speaker today. So Dr. C J Reddy is a vice president, business development, electromagnetics, Americas at Alter Engineering, and Dr. Reddy received his B Tech degree in electronic and communication engineering from Regional College of Warangal, India, and he did his M.Tech and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kharagpur in India. He worked as a scientific officer at Samir, uh, Mumbai during 1987 to 1991. Dr. Reddy was awarded the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada Visiting Fellowship to work at the Communication Research Center in Ottawa during 91 to 93 and was awarded the U.S. National Research Council Resident Research Associateship in 1993 to work at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. He has also worked as a research professor at Hampton University from 95 to 2000. Dr. Reddy was a president of Applied EM Inc. Uh, from 2000 to 2017, where he led several Phase 1 and Phase 2 SBIR projects for DOD and NASA. He was also the president of EM Software USA and led the marketing of EM simulation tool FICO in North America and EM software and system USA in Klein was acquired by Alter later in 2014. Dr. Reddy is fellow of IEEE, fellow of ACS, fellow of AMTA. He has served as an ACS board of director from 2006 to 12 and again from 2015 to 18. He was awarded Distinguished Alumni Professional Achievement Award by his alma mater, NIT Warangal in 2015. He has published 39 journal papers, 125 conference, and 18 NASA technical reports till date. He is a co author of the book Entity Analysis and Design Using FICO Electromagnetic Simulation Software by SciTech. He has also co authored a book chapter in Handbook of Reflector Entities and Fate Systems, Volume 2 by Artec House. He is serving as an associate editor for the newly introduced IEEE Open Journal of Antennas in Propagation. And he is appointed IEEE Board of Directors to the position of IEEE Fellow Committee Member for the term 22. 20 to 2021. He is also serving as a chair of the Young Professional Committee of IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society. Dr. Reddy is elected as a member of AMTA Board of Directors for three year terms starting January 2020 and is a technical coordinator for AMTA 2020 and 2021 conferences. And currently, he is serving as a president of AMTA for one year terms starting from January 1, 2022. So, thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. I hand it over uh, platform to you to start your talk now. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Kedar, um, Ash Ashutosh, Puneet, and Chandra Kanta for um, giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, let me um, quickly see where I am uh, on this one. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. Um, one of the um, things I want to mention is that, you know, I not only am now the member of the fellow committee, but also in the past, you know, I nominated a few people. I also acted as a referee professor. I was a nominee myself when I was nominated by uh, Professor Patak uh, to the um, fellow grade. Of course, now serving in the fellow committee. So 
I gathered some wisdom and I wanted to share that with you. And uh, I actually like the opportunity provided to me here. So um, to before we um, go into the actual um, uh, the outline of the presentation, I guess is that you know I just want to start with what are the member grades we have, what fellow grade means, and then in the elevation process there are various players. Who who are those players and what? role they play. And then of course, there are all fellow nominations are not the same because there are various nomination categories. As Puneet was mentioning, you know, we have industry and we have uh, government as well as we have the academia and those kind of categories. And then um, I'll also want to take a look at the nomination reference and endorsement forms that are actually used and how they are organized. So we have an understanding of what goes in there or what need to go in there. And then we'll talk about the elevation process, what happens from nomination to the society, to the fellow or committee, as well as to the IEEE Board of Directors. Um, then of course, we'll talk about the considerations for a successful nomination. And um, I'll also talk about some common mis misconceptions that people have, even I had some misconceptions uh, earlier, and uh, we'll provide the resources um, that are needed. Because whatever I'm saying here are my own opinions, uh, though I took most of the things from the IEEE literature, but not necessarily express the views and opinions of IEEE or my employer or tail. Because you all know IEEE, so I don't want to go in here. I just want to focus on this number. Um, IEEE typically has 400,000 members all over the world, I guess, and there is no country that IEEE does not exist. So. Um, in terms of member grades wise, uh, we have student member, it's very uh, obvious here. Then we have a member, once you graduate and you join the industry, you become a member. Then after a few years of experience, you can become a senior member. Uh, for these ones, you know, there is no limits or anything that you can have any number of student members, any number of members, any number of senior members. Of course, the fellow grade is the one which is a bit restricted in terms of numbers that we'll talk about. Then there's a last one, which is called life member, life senior member, life fellow. Uh, what this means is that if you reach 65 years of age and you are an IEEE member for 35 years, making the total to be 100 years or more than 35 years, I guess, minimum 35 years of membership, then you become either if you're a member, life member, if you're a senior member, life member, senior member, life fellow member. Advantage is that uh, your juice and um, uh, some of the regional assessments are waived for life members. So that's uh, giving back to the, you know, for your dedication to the IEEE, IEEE provides this um, facility, I guess. So. so our focus today is in the fellow grade. So coming to fellow grade, um, as we all know that, you know, it's a very prestigious um, uh, grade in IEEE uh, that one could get. Uh, this is accorded to the extraordinary accomplishments in any fields, any of the IEEE fields of interest, that is broad range of fields. I think we have seen in the first slide, we have around 49 societies and uh, uh, many technical uh, councils as well. So spanning all those societies and councils. Um, spanning all those societies and their expertise and those kind of things. So they have to be honored uh, that have contributed importantly to the application of engineering, science and technology. And of course, more importantly, what it brought to the, uh, what value it brought to the society. That's uh, actually the one of the key things, I guess, uh, in fellow grade elevation that is uh, looked into. Uh, as I think we have previously mentioned, you know, this is restricted to 0.1% of the, um, 0.1% of the IEEE voting membership in the preceding calendar year. Uh, that is, let's say if you're doing it this year, what was the membership last year in 2020? And that would be taken into account. Though, you know, again, going back to my first slide, that's the reason why I put the first slide, 400,000 members that we said, so 0.1% would have been 400. But typically this is also restricted a little bit by uh, either fellow committee or board Typically, it is less than 300 elevations per year. So even though we're saying 0.1% of the membership, it's even less than 0.1% of the memberships are, uh, membership is elevated. Uh, just to take a look at the historical data, 
uh, starting from 1999, I took from a, um, a document that's available on the website to 2021, um, elevation, the nominations received, you can see that it, back in 99, there are only less than 600 nominations. If you take, look at today, there are three, 936 nominations in 2021. Uh, but if you look at the elevations, they have not changed much Back in um, uh, 99, uh, there were 240 um, elevations, and uh, of course, uh, 2021, 282. I don't think it changed much in 2020 for the coming year as well. So, what I, the reason I want to put this is because there's a stiff competition for elevation. So, it is not that you know one is qualified or not qualified. Uh, it is to, one can make into this. 282 uh, list of the elevations are not out of this 936. Because my experience when I looked at uh, some of these uh, nominations, most of them are well qualified, I would say. But I you know you have to compare one to the other, right? So uh, in that one, you're only, you can only have 282. So writing a good nomination can help a lot in um, getting ahead, I guess, or getting noticed in the, in the crowd. Um, just, I just want to, some numbers here, you know, you can see academia has uh, education institutions, for example, uh, bulk of the uh, nominations come from. Government, uh, also a little bit less, but of the industry you can see that it's not that bad. They also seem to be doing quite well, but of course it's remaining constant here, whereas it's increasing on the academic side. Government side remains somewhat similar um, numbers. But if you look at the elevations, they are kind of proportional, I would say, 675, that's 207 here, 50 out of, 7 out of 50, and 60 out of 200 here, so on and so forth. So it's not that, you know, the, the academy are dominating the elevations or have advantage, it's just that they have more um, nominations that are coming in, so you see the more uh, elevations, but uh, the percentage-wise probably we are in the same. So more nominations come from industry, probably we'll see more industry nominations as well. Um, I just want to give you a preview of what happens in the process. Uh, I don't want, I will talk about this in more detail later on, but I just want to show you a you know, kind of a flow chart that goes from nomination to the society, to the fellow committee here, and then to the board of directors there. So before we take a look at this one, let's take a look at the process itself in terms of the, what are the, who are the players in this uh, process? One, of course, the nominator. This, of course, many people have misconception that, you know, a fellow has to be, a fellow, a nominator has to be an IEEE fellow, and uh, it is not required. Anybody, they could be even non IEEE members can nominate. So uh, this is something, you know, we have to think about, I guess, when we're choosing the, uh, or the nominator, you know, can be anybody. Uh, it doesn't need to be an IEEE member, it doesn't need to be an IEEE fellow, or it doesn't need to be an IEEE senior member. Um, then we have nominee. Nominee has to be an IEEE senior member in good standing. What that means is that, you know, the current juice have to be in current, uh, you know, they would have paid the juice for the current year. And um, that has been a member of for at least five years. Not as a senior member, it could be even as a member, at least for five years. And then, of course, one should be a, senior member when it is, when uh, that particular person is nominated. Then of course, the references, they must be IEEE fellows. So that's something we have to keep in mind that um, um, a nominator can be anybody, but you know, reference have to be IEEE fellow, um, except for region nine. I'll talk about this one later on, which is the South American. Uh, they could have senior members could be references. Minimum three, maximum five. Actually, this is a new development in the last few years. Before it was minimum five and maximum eight, and they reduced that to minimum three to maximum five. Um, endorsements, uh, this is, you know, this could be anybody and uh, including non IEEE members. So one can take advantage of endorsements as well because you don't have to have an IEEE fellow endorsing your uh, nomination. Um, then, of course, the Society and Technical Council. This is, you know, if you're, you know, in our case, for example, AP Society or the MTT Society or other societies, they have their own evaluation committees. These are the experts in the field 
that uh, look at these nominations and uh, they send out their scores to the fellow committee. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then, of course, the fellow committee at the end uh, that evaluates all um, nominations. Of course, the society evaluates only their nominations that are designated to them. Fellow committee looks at all societies, including that 49 plus technical councils, uh, so on and so forth. So a nominator, what nominator that need to do? Uh, well, of course, self-nominations are not allowed. So you cannot nominate yourself, but uh, a nominator has to be there. And um, as I mentioned, it could be uh, anybody, including non ITP members. Responsibilities is that, you know, complete the fellow grade nomination form, identify minimum three, but not more than five references who are ITP fellows, identify three endorsements as optional. You don't need to have endorsements, but I, I think it's always recommended that you find good, especially when you're coming from industry. Um, and of course, submit the fellow grade nomination on the uh, web application online uh, on 1st of March. That's a deadline, the midnight, I think 11.59 uh, p.m. on um, February 29th, I guess, um, or March 1st. More importantly, this is something that's missed by nominators most of the time is that they are not reading the uh, guidance that is provided, especially the ones who are maybe submitting the first time nomination. So there is a very extensive how to write an effective nomination, actually updated uh, a couple of months ago in October 2021 on the, I'll give this uh, links at the end, I guess that you all can uh, download. Um, and it's very critical that because things are changing, as I said, you know, before it was five minimum and eight references, and now it's three minimum and five references. So the things are changing, the way nominations are, um, um, are submitted or prepared and those kind of things. It's always good to have a good understanding of uh, what needs to be done when you want to write an effective nomination. Nominee, um, of course, as I mentioned, you know, senior or life senior member in good standing. Um, and of course, five years of uh, uh, one. And the responsibilities, <laughs> actually, in theoretically, no responsibilities because nominator is supposed to take care of all the responsibilities of the nomination package. But of course, in practice, a uh, nominee could help a nominator uh, pro with the information that may be required for the nomination so that you know nominator has uh, full information than restricted to his own knowledge of um, the nominee. Uh, with respect to reference, uh, IEEE fellow or a life fellow can act as a reference. And for region nine, um, IEEE life senior member or a senior member can act when they are only referencing for the nominees within the region nine, that's the South American uh, region. So they can't provide for outside region nine, only for the region nine one. Um, responsibilities, complete the fellow grade reference form. Uh, this is online and uh, submit that again online before uh, March. So re references have access to the nomination form so they can read the nomination form as well and address those issues within the uh, reference form they're going to fill in. Again, for them also, there is a guide that is prepared by IEEE, effective references and endorsement. Uh, it's a good practice for nominators to when they're asking the reference for, an, for their nominee, also provide the, a link to this um, uh, the guide so that they can read and see how the reference should be written because what is important in the reference letter, because people normally write reference letters for various things, right, for your um, a job or for something else and some awards and things like that. Each one have different criteria how reference need to be provided. So in this case, it will be useful if they can also read this one. So it's a, as a good practice, I think the nominator should send this link to the, um, the references so they can um, read and um, provide a proper reference that, are, that, that is useful. Endorsement, endorser, as I mentioned, you know, any person including non IEEE members can be an endorser. Again, the same responsibilities. They fill in the endorsement form. And uh, this is a web application. Neither the nominator nor the nominee or anybody else will see these uh, forms uh, because they're submitted uh, independently on the, on the website um, of the, uh, the fellows one. Again, you know, here, it's a good practice to send them a link to this uh, uh, the guide 
how to write a good endorsement. Um, I, I like this one because they also give you some examples of you know how to some um, uh, what I call it, what is a good practice of writing these um, references and endorsements. Then comes the so this is of course a part of the nominator, nominee, and um, uh, references and endorsers. Then comes the part of the society and technical evaluation committee. This committee is, uh, let's say is, uh, if you take antennas and propagation or MTT, these are the prominent members and fellows of that uh, society that have good knowledge about uh, what goes on in the technology of that uh, particular society uh, with antennas and uh, what, what's happening in antennas propagation, what's happening in micro theory and techniques, if it's electronic devices, what's happening in that area. They are the ones technically savvy enough to understand the nomination, be able to provide a good assessment that uh, can be used by the fellow committee. So they provide them not, so their assessment will be based on the nomination and endorsement forms. They don't see the reference letters. So uh, this is purely based on what is written in the nomination form and of course endorsement. So this also makes the endorsements critical that, you know, um, to to add them, uh, not ignore them because they are read by the society uh, evaluation committees. Uh, so they evaluate the innovation, creativity, impact on uh, and degree of acceptance of the contributions because they're also in the field. They know, let's say you developed a new antenna technology, how is it accepted within the community? They already know because they have been in that area um, they also identify individual role in the contributions because sometimes you know, in the papers you have multiple authors. So they could also see from their experience what role the, uh, the nominee played in those things. The impact of it because they also can see what impact that already created um, uh, because of those innovations. Uh, so they can also provide some evidence saying that uh, we know this person and he's got done some great work. Of course, those are what I call now, but they have to provide some qualitative uh, information. They're saying that um, this person could qualify for a fellow grade. Um, so they provide only technical assessment. They don't provide, um, they don't consider the service to the society or IEEE uh, in their assessment. They only, only fellow committee looks at those things. The, the society or technical council only looks at the technical side of your nomination. Um, so other drawback, uh, I wouldn't say drawback, but uh, their assessment is based on only on the nominations that are received by the society, but not, you know, they don't see anything else. They don't see, let's say APS doesn't see what MTT uh, nominations are and vice versa. So their, their assessment is only based on the nominations that are received by the society itself. Uh, so fellow committee, they are the ones who look at everything. That means that they look at the nomination, endorsements, reference forms as well. They also have uh, uh, society evaluation forms. Uh, I'll also talk about those evaluation forms, what they contain, and the score and the rank that is provided by the society. And then they do their own due diligence, uh, irrespective of what society says and irrespective of other things. They look at all these things together and they also look at their own uh, perception of the uh, nomination uh, there. And then critically assess how convincing or well-made case presented by the society evaluation committee and the nomination. Uh, of course, so you have to remember that um, as a fellow committee member, for example, myself, I don't represent antennas and propagation there. I represent IEEE. And uh, more than often, you know, if I come across a nomination that I, the person I'm working with, or the person who is in my company or my university, a fellow committee member has to declare a conflict of interest because you're not supposed to be evaluating somebody who are who, who with whom you may have conflict of interest. So one of the things that um, uh, fellow committee members look at, I guess, is that they look at across the board, all the 49 societies and technical councils. So you don't expect them to be an experts in all the fields. So this is where how articulate the nomination form convincing the fellow committee member who is you know, reasonably educated uh, to understand the technology 
that um, uh, this is a well worth uh, nominee for it to be elevated to the grade of fellow. Um, so they also compare, you know, it's not just uh, individual nominations, it's also comparing across the board various nominations that are coming from, because as you mentioned earlier, uh, this is a competition. Um, essentially, uh, you have thousand, approximately 1,000 nominations and you are only elevating 280 plus uh, uh, people to the fellow grade. So you have to be competing in that, com in that race, I guess, in a way you can think of it as a race. Um, and of course, at the end, they recommend to the um, IEEE board the number of nominees, the IEEE list of nominees to be elevation to the fellow grade. Um, how many members are there in the fellow committee? Around 50 members. Uh, so you can think of you know, 50 fellow committee members uh, assessing 1,000 uh, nominations. There's a lot of work there. Um, they are elected for two year term or appointed for two year term. For example, I am appointed for 2021. And of course, I just came to know last week that I'm going to be serving again from 2022 to 2023. I think my understanding is that at a time you can do two terms, that is uh, two, two of the two year terms. So uh, fellow grade members can stay up to four years. And of course, they can take a break and come back again if, uh, later on if they want uh, uh, to do the work, I guess. Um, um, so that's about the players. Now let's talk about the nomination categories because as we've seen, you know, there are different uh, um, people from academia, people from industry, people from government and other places are nominating, sending the nominations. So to accommodate that, IEEE has made four different categories. One is application engineer and practitioner. Other one is educator. And the third one is a research engineer and scientist. Um, and the fourth one is technical leader, so that they can accommodate various types of um, uh, people who achieved, uh, you know, the, um, the who are accomplished to be able to elevate as a fellow grade, not just, for example, uh, who published most papers kind of thing. Um, so when it comes to application and practitioner, this is you know, mostly coming from industry. If you someone developed a product or the systems. And these are uh, implemented in industry, either in a certain sector or worldwide, those kind of uh, things. And um, those things in the nomination, you should be able to uh, articulate that, you know, what type of product development was taken, you know, what type of process improvement was done, what type of manufacturing innovation was done, contributions to any of the uh, standards and their implementation, whether they're uh, across the board implemented or not. Uh, of course, not but not least in most of these cases, you know, when you're working in industry, uh, it could be a team effort that, you know, many people are involved, but uh, they should be able to address what is the nominee's individual contribution to these developments. That's very critical in, um, uh, in, in such a nomination. And also what is, again, as I said, you know, what role that particular nominee played uh, if this was done by a group. Um, and uh, what is the innovation creativity that has been demonstrated and the importance of the development advancement and application. Uh, later on, we'll see uh, how, what is the tangible evidence that need to be provided. Of course, in this case, you know, it not necessarily be the, uh, uh, the uh, papers published in journals and things like that. It could be patents or reports, articles, and the presentations. Maybe you are giving a, presentation in an industry leading uh, uh, conference, you are the keynote speaker. That could be an evidence that you know you are an authority in the in that particular technology that you implemented and things like that. So things of that sort, not necessarily the papers or citations and those kind of things. Uh, looking at the educator category, this is of course obviously related to how this is essentially for teachers, I would say, uh, how the they created a new way of teaching that is widely accepted. Or you have, for example, a pioneering textbook that has been widely adopted across the various universities, not only in your country, but also across the world and those kind of things. So here, um, what is the impact on the education? And um, what kind of curricular courses that are developed? And so on and so forth. Uh, so this is essentially engineering education. This is nothing to do with the technical 
accomplishments or you know developing new technologies and things like that, developing new techniques of education that has been revolutionized the technical um, education area. Um, of course, if you have written a book and things like that, that's good. Technical articles are also good, provided they are addressing the education technology or education process that you develop that are again widely accepted, cited by other educators and so on and so forth. Um, so that should be to be taken into consideration while writing this uh, nomination. Uh, research scientists, obviously, as you can see, this is the most popular one where um, the scholarly work with the peer-reviewed publications, books and papers and uh, patents and uh, those kind of publications play a critical role. And of course, in this case, one has to highlight the inventions, discoveries and advances that are made by the nominee. And of course, at the same time, what impact of these contributions created in advancing the technology, either it's for the industry or, um, uh, or in other ways, I guess. Um, so how do we show the impact? Uh, that is subsequent research. Let's say you started a research area that is adopted by many more, many other people to advance the technology. And of course, if it has already been implemented in products or systems, or it's commercialized, uh, uh, that's all you know. Impact that your research is creating to the society. And uh, essentially, at the end of the day, that's the motto of I to play, right? Advancing the technology for the benefit of the society. Um, Technical leader, this is um, um, also an important category because uh, again, you know, addressing the government as well as the uh, industry where there are technical leaders who are leading the technology, but may not have many publications like scholarly publications and so on and so forth. So this is where we emphasize the technical innovation of a uh, device that was developed or a product that is developed or a system uh, that is leading to an you know, application or a production of um, uh, a device. Uh, things to cover in this one, um, what is being developed technically, and um, what we have to address, I guess, is has this been resulted in any, um, uh, from a team or a company-wide effort led by the nominee? Nominee has to lead. Uh, in this case, you know, we're not talking about program managing and things like that. We're talking about um, uh, technically leading means the person should be involved technically in the process and uh, their contributions uh, to the um, uh, process, I guess. Um, and then because of that, uh, what financial benefits and those kind of things that has been uh, achieved uh, for the company or for others as well. If you, let's say you developed a patent and that was, you went to somebody else and they, of course, that can be also be the one. Uh, what are the technological challenges, so for example, market acceptability, implementation difficulty, financial risk, and how they were solved uh, as a technical leader, how the nominee has uh, overcome those things. In all those things, again, you have to identify the nominee's technical contributions and innovations. Um, it cannot be, you know, you're a manager and everybody else is doing the work and you're leading the team but you're also involved in the technically into the team. For example, a CTO could be a good example of you know, involved. Maybe a CEO of a technical company may or may not be involved in the technical side of the development. It's not necessary that CEO also could be involved, but in, I'm just giving an example, I guess. So if you look at these four categories, you can see that application engineering, um, very less number of uh, nominations of all ones predominantly coming from industry. Um, and of course, the educa educator category, uh, again, small number of nominations coming, uh, mostly from the academia. And the research engineers and scientists, this is the bulk of the nominations we get as well as seen. And of course, technical leader, 10% of the all nominations taken over, you know, over um, 200, 2015 to 2019 year once. So common principles to for all these four, uh, is must have individual technical and educational contributions. If you're in the EDU category, it should be your contribution, nominee's contribution. Uh, also in other categories, it should be nominee's technical contributions, individual contribution that has to be highlighted. Um, but of course, we do consider by practitioners that application engineers 
what kind of implementation that is being done and developments that are done, uh, technical developments that are being uh, done uh, by the nominee. And of course, the impact of the contribution must be already evident. Uh, that means you, for example, research scientist, you write a research engineer or a scientist who wrote a paper today and published uh, um, uh, now, and you cannot say this will have a great impact 10 years from now. It should be already uh, available to the uh, judges, I guess, to see that what is the impact. That means maybe the paper you published 10 years now before, and now it had an impact on the society that need to be uh, um, um, emphasized there. This is where the most of the uh, difficulty comes from verifiable evidence of the contribution and impact. Uh, that means, see, as a uh, fellow committee member, I don't have the expertise of all the 49 society fields that I have. I rely upon the nomination that is provided. So the nomination should clearly indicate what is the contribution of the nominee, and um, of course the evidence of that contribution, and then what is the impact of that contribution and the evidence of that contribution, the, the evidence of that uh, impact should be provided so that you know one can um, objectively assess the uh, nominee for the fellow applicant for the for fellow grade uh, of course this is where another critical thing is that as you can see all nominees are not the same because we have these four categories depending on the category we should think about what kind of um, contribution you should present what should, what type of uh, uh, impact you should present uh, for those categories accordingly uh, there with that, you know, briefly, let's look at the uh, nomination form. Um, this is, of course, the, the online form, I guess this looks like this. This is, of course, the easiest part, you know, you just fill in the one. Uh, the most difficult one is the, uh, uh, not the relation with the nominee. This is also important here, the nominator should explain how well he knows the nominee so that he is able to nominate him for the fellow grade. Um, and then, of course, the most difficult one, not difficult one, the um, category. You should uh, choose which category the nominator uh, falls in um, uh, as an application, because based on that, uh, you are able to write the nomination form accordingly, because it's not the same for everybody, right? So you should identify that. And then, of course, the society, you should identify a society which can assess the uh, nomination form. Uh, one thing um, in this case to look at, I guess, is that um, obviously we want to apply to the society or go to the society that knows your field best, or knows the uh, nominee's fields best. Of course, one, uh, another thing I learned from uh, the material right now is that you don't have to be a member of that society. You can apply to, you can assign this to any society. So for evaluation. Of course, best to assign to the society. For example, if I'm an antenna researcher, I would like to go with antennas and propagation. If I'm developing micro devices, I would like to go with micro theory and technology because they know my field best and they can assess my application best. Um, then, of course, the uh, things to consider, I guess, is the, uh, the first, in, so two individual contributions need to be identified uh, here. Uh, you may have many, many accomplishments as a nominee, but the um, nominator has to identify two main individual contributions. And once, once those are identified based on the category that you chose, of course, you have to explain what that contribution is. And then you have to explain evidence of the contribution. Let's say you have done great work in a particular area. You have to show what kind of papers you published or what kind of other evidence like patents and things like that you have so that they can be verified. You know, you can go to the website or uh, Google and find out uh, that evidence for the contribution and the impact, what impact it had got, and then the evidence of the impact uh, also need to be, that's what we call on a verifiable evidence. That means somebody should be able to find that out in a public domain, uh, then we can know that that's true. And more often, you know, fellow judges go out and look on the website, um, whatever profiles you have and the links you have, are also you know, searching for those kind of evidence to make sure that uh, the, what is uh, cited here is the correct one. Then of course, the same thing goes with the second contribution. 
um, you should uh, talk about the contribution and evidence of the contribution impact and uh, evidence of the impact. Um, then comes the um, activities, the awards uh, that you receive. Of course, you can, you can specify any awards you like or whatever you receive, but at the same time, the awards that are related to the contributions, the two contributions may play a big role compared to let's say the awards that are not related to those contributions. But if they are there, I think you want to prioritize them and put them on the top, uh, those ones. Then IEEE activities and non IEEE activities as well. Right now you're served in committees and you, um, you're a general chair for a conference or you're in the board of directors or in the ADCOM and those kind of things, or regional activities. Non IEEE non activities as well in other uh, places where you played a role, uh, you could uh, include them also here. So they're also considered, but we'll talk about those percentages, I guess, how well these are weighted uh, across the board. Then comes the, the, the references. Of course, proposed citation is one thing the nominator can write, uh, but of course, this is not a very critical one, but you know, there are guidelines on how to write that and a fellow committee will look at that and um, make a modification later on, depending on what uh, they think about it. And of course, the references, we already talked about that endorsement. One comment I want to make here with references and endorsements is that you need to go to somebody uh, that knows the nominee very well, uh, means knows technically, uh, professionally very well, and willing to write the nomination. Uh, sometimes we found that uh, people ask for five references and only three of them return the references, which sometimes, you know, the judges can see how many are requ requested and how many are received. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a perception, so, I, so it may or may not look good if you requested five and only three are received. If you know that only three are going to send the references, ask just three. You don't have to ask for five. Uh, same thing with endorsements as well. It's good to have endorsements, but make sure that uh, the endorser knows the nominee very well, professionally, and is willing to support the nomination and um, is able to send the nominee the endorsement form uh, to the to the committee. So, when you look at the reference form, um, this is a very simple one, I guess. You know, it says again your the references relationship to the nominee, and then the how they fall into the fellow requirements. And of course, the reference credentials, uh, you know, uh, that also plays a good role on what, depending on what they write in this section, section three. And um, they can also say what kind of uh, category, I mean, they can also, whether it's an application engineer or technical leader and those kind of things. Um, obviously, uh, I we would think that it would be in line with what the nomination form says, but, um, Sometimes I see the you know some sometimes they differ and then say you could this nominee could be more fit into the technical leader category rather than researcher category or vice versa. More importantly, they also give you um, of course this is a very important section that they need to fill in. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And at the end, they also give you this uh, um, give the nominee this um, uh, grading I guess you know extraordinary qualified highly qualified qualified marginally qualified, not qualified. Obviously, you know, everybody would like to get extraordinarily qualified as uh, the uh, grading here, but uh, what they just look at is, you now they don't just look at this one, they also look at what they wrote earlier um, in terms of the nominee. And uh, sometimes, you know, we find that there's a disparity between these two. Sometimes they say extraordinarily qualified and somewhere here they'll say, okay, it's not a, he or she, the nominee, is uh, qualified but may not be well qualified in, the, in their words. So, so uh, one made to make sure that this, whatever they write here goes with this one uh, here. Of course, it's not uncommon that the references also give you the lower grades like highly qualified or qualified that can also influence the grading process in the um, one. Endorsement form, it's a, again, simple one where you start with the relationship, you know, how endorser uh, knows the nominee uh, professionally. And of course, the key thing is uh, nominee's achievements uh, in, in, the, in, in the words of the endorsee, endorser and his uh, endorser credentials. Again, this is also looked into is, uh, is uh, of course you can go to the 
a company product manager, for example, who is giving, who implemented your technology and knows you know, what kind of uh, revenues it generated and what impact it had got. Uh, so the higher in the hierarchy in the company or uh, any other organization you can go to for an endorser will have more effect, but also um, their knowledge of your uh, or nominee's um, um, uh, involvement professionally will also help. So again, let's now go back to our, now that we have seen uh, uh, the various players and the nomination categories and uh, the nomination forms, reference forms and endorsement forms. Let's take a look at this uh, flow chart here. Uh, we'll go with you know, step one. This we already talked about. Uh, no, I'm not going to spend time on this one. Um, the society, again, we talked about it. Uh, only thing I want to highlight here is that, uh, so this one done by before March 1st, and then the society takes a look at it uh, from March to June timeframe. Uh, they have their own committees and each uh, society has their own committee and they look at it, um, uh, these applications and provide, uh, as I mentioned, a technical assessment only. They don't look at the references. They look at the nomination form and endorsement forms if they're available and they do technical assessment. And then they rank the uh, nominees. Um, so of their society, uh, not overall, right? They only have access to their own society nominations. Uh, so this is the form they fill in for each nominee. Here, you can see they have to highlight what contribution. They also have to write a narrative based on the nominations. What are the contributions of the nominee? And they can also say if they're, they made an impact or not impact or what, if they fall below the fellow grade um, uh, assessment. So they also have to do the what kind of contributions the nomination has, the impact that contribution had, the evidence and their own uh, assessment of it um, from the nomination. And also sometimes you know they also have to say, um, uh, I'm trying to look here, whether it uh, falls below the, uh, if it falls, it is, for example, 4C says if the impact falls short of IEEE fellow standards, they have to justify why that is the case as well. Um, and then here they also do scoring, uh, extra, extremely qualified, highly qualified with a 9 to 100%, 90 to 100% and uh, so on and so forth. And they go up to 60% and of course at the end, everybody else fall under the, this D here. They also look at you know whether the nominee falls under uh, different categories than what the nominator uh, um, felt like and uh, so on and so forth. And also they can take a look at the uh, citation. So this is also an important role, I guess. So they send this form to fellow committee, but also they send a summary form from their society. For example, they have the nominees ranked one, two, three, four, five. They can't have two of them. There's no tie in this one. Uh, there, has, there has to be one at each rank. And um, they put the score that uh, mentioned before, you know, extremely qualified is uh, 100 to 90% and highly qualified is below that and the qualified is below that. And then the medium qualified, there's no scoring. Uh, they stop at 60% of their scoring and uh, they are not scored, I guess, in this case. Uh, so this is what they sent to fellow committee so that, you know, we can assess those things. Um, so they, then it comes to fellow committee with, uh, um, what happens from July to September. And uh, I just want to give a little bit of insight into this uh, weighting uh, of these, um, uh, whatever the material that comes to fellow committee, how this is weighted uh, by them. Uh, individual technical contributions is 40%. This is you know, the most important thing that nomination can have, nomination form can have. That is, you know, in this nomination form, these two individual contributions that play a greater role uh, as I mentioned before, contribution, evidence of the contribution, impact, evidence of the impact. And the society support, uh, based on those two forms, they supply 25% of it. Uh, of course, this 25%, you know, is not directly related to the percentage they gave you uh, as a nominee, uh, but it depends on their write-up as well as their scoring and how well they all uh, fit together. But also there is a normalization among various societies, because some societies have um, 100 the nominations, nominations, and some societies have as little as you know, four nominations. 
So there is a bit of a disparity in scoring of these nominations by the society. So fellow committee will put all these things together, normalize them. So that score, including the narrative, the fellow judge will um, uh, put a 25% uh, uh, weighted out of 25% whatever points that need to be given. Reference support, that includes the references and endorsements, 15%. So this also plays a critical role after the uh, society support. Then of course, professional activities that IEEE, non-IEEE non awards, IEEE, non-IEEE activities that you have in the nomination that play 10% kind of thing. So you can see that this is more important one. Then of course, if this is good, so you'll definitely get a society support. Then of course, the references obviously based on your accomplishments will give a good uh, one. And uh, this is all good, but of course, if you're also active, this is not necessary, but you know, because it's only 10%, but if you're also active, this can add up. This is where in you know, a border cases where you're competing with somebody, all things being equal, this could make a difference in your uh, uh, nomination. Uh, so if you add up all these uh, numbers, it only uh, adds to 90%. So what happens to the rest of the 10%? That 10% goes to experience recognition. This is automated. Um, we don't look at it as fellow judges. This is automated. I think there is some mathematics that goes into 0.1 points for each year since the nominee's first degree and then they average out and normalize and those kind of things. That's automatically done, so we don't, uh, but this is where that 10% that, that 10, 10 goes into. Uh, of course, <laughs> this is not to say that, you know, more experience you have your advantage, but as um, we mentioned before, even anger people got elevated um, without, you know, many years of experience, but because of their contributions to the technical field. Uh, so what happens in the committee? I know I'm going a little bit over time, um, but I hope I can um, continue and um, uh, complete. I think there are only five more minutes, I guess, on my presentation now. Uh, and of course, I'll be available here till, uh, I think, 8.30 your time, because uh, I can answer any questions uh, as well uh, afterwards. I just put this slide to- Please take illustrate. your own time, yeah. Dr. Reddy, no issues. Please take sure, your own sure. time. Very nice Thank presentation. You. Thank you, thank you. Um, I put this one because this is something what happens in the fellow committee. Once it comes to fellow committee, when fellow committee has all the nominations uh, from all the societies and everything else, like all the thousand nominations, for example, what they do is that they take these ones and divide them into two piles. One pile goes to what's called expedited evaluation of top and bottom nominees. Uh, when they say top and bottom nominees, what this means is that Societies have this top nominees, like 5% uh, of the top ones, and then the bottom ones, 30% of the bottom ones. So they, this is also a new procedure in the last few years, I guess. Um, um, they take up, uh, they, they, they are given to some experienced evaluators, or a group of experienced evaluators who would say, okay, this top 5%, everything is good, or if now something is not good, they're given to the general pool. And uh, same thing with the bottom one. Yeah, this seems like we agree and these people may not qualify for to be a fellow and we can fail them. But if they do see a, a qualified one in the bottom one, they can send it to the uh, general pool. That general pool consists of uh, many, ten, almost I think 10 groups, I guess, or uh, yeah, close to 10 groups, I would say. Uh, each group consisting of four judges, fellow judges. These four fellow judges will, get, uh, uh, I think uh, each one get around 70 plus same applications. So four judges eva evaluate uh, all the 70, uh, each of the 70 that are assigned to them without talking to each other. Even they don't know who is the other judges in that four group and they evaluate and rank and everything. Once they do that, <clears throat> they again meet uh, this four of them individually, these groups, individually to meet and then say, if there are any discrepancies, let's say uh, one judge scored uh, somebody very high in ranking and other judge scored very low in ranking for the same nominee, uh, they look at the standard deviation of these things. Of course, if all four agree and they're within the standard deviation tolerance, uh, they're all good, I think. And time to time you see at least five or six uh, uh, nominations that are 
widely varying. Like one judge says uh, is my he or she, I think the nominee is my top rank, and then this other one says is the bottom rank, and they meet and then discuss and um, uh, resolve those uh, differences. Why somebody thought uh, the nominee is very highly valued, and why somebody thought the nominee is not. So one can discuss and uh, present the evidence from the nomination to say good or bad, and then they finalize that list. So, so same as all the groups, they all go to one single ranking. Then they merge everything um, uh, together and make a single ranking out of um, uh, those thousand nominations or so. Then they meet at, uh, uh, of course, in the normal times face to face for two days or so. Of course, nowadays in a virtual meeting to discuss any cases that uh, once it comes here, before coming here, all the judges are given access to all the nominations, all the thousand nominations. So. If one of the judges could go into any of the groups and then see someone is um, above the um, uh, cutoff, for example, 282, for example, someone is at 125, and he or she feels that the judge feels that uh, maybe this person does not, doesn't deserve to be a fellow, they can flag them. And same vice versa, someone is at, let's say, 350, which is above the 282. Uh, ranking and someone can um, look at that nomination and say, okay, we feel that this person uh, is qualified to be a fellow and they can flag them. So there's a flag committee that goes through all this flagging process to make sure they are okay. And of course, they can bring those cases to the face-to-face -face meeting as well. They give us ahead of time who those cases are, the flagging cases, and what the reasons are given by those judges. And we, all of them and all the 50 judges could go through those nominations and um, it is open for discussion. And of course, at the end, it's the voting process by which you know they select those flagged uh, candidates. And then they finalize everything in those two meetings and send the final list to the board, uh, IEEE board for, um, uh, for recommendation, I guess. But of course, IEEE board can say, we don't want all 282, we want only 250, or they can say, we could even go higher and then uh, uh, it depends on IEEE board's decision, I guess, when it comes out. So this is the whole process that goes and you can see that it's very, very, um, uh, I would say fair in terms of, you know, there are so many players involved. It's not one person or two people influencing anything. I mean, they can't influence at all in a way, I guess. Even this flagging process, they just cannot flag somebody if there is a, a conflict of interest, for example, uh, if someone is working in the same university and um, he is a judge, he or she is a judge, and there is somebody else in the from the same university, they can't flag them because there's a conflict of interest. Uh, similarly, you know, other conflict of interests are taken care of. We're all given the training as well as we need to certify that we don't have any conflict of interest with the nominees that we're assessing there. So the final one, I would like to uh, uh, take a little bit of time here. Uh, what should be the considerations for a successful nomination? So first of all, you know, when you want to nominate somebody, look at all the, um, the advances. Um, uh, I'm sorry. So there are three things, the four things you have to consider, right? One is the technical innovations for the research category, technical le leadership category, and contributions on the apply application engineering, and of course, the uh, education here. So what is not a contribution, technical contribution? Uh, typical mistakes that are found in nominations is that receiving a grant, um, although sometimes can grants can be used as an evidence of impact, because I did this research, I got this much grant, could be an impact, but uh, grant in itself, you know, I got 10 grants, uh, itself is not a contribution. Um, and a successful leadership in managing a business line is not a technical contribution even, it is a technology company. You have, to, you have to be, the Omni has to be technically involved in the uh, process of the product development. Uh, again, award is also not a, an evidence that, you know, um, of technical contribution, but it could be an impact of the technical contribution or an accomplishment. Uh, this is, of course, a very common thing that uh, people find a bit confusing is that work done during the PhD um, it is considered, yes, it's a contribution, but uh, most of the judges look at it as, okay, it is done through supervision 
of your supervisor. So it has a little bit lesser weight. So focus on something that you have done after PhD that uh, you have done independently as a nominee. That could have more impact than uh, projecting the work done during the uh, uh, the uh, PhD process. And volunteering in IEEE. Of course, again, this has got some value, the 10% I put on the professional uh, activities, but it is not a technical contribution. You can't put on those first two categories we said, first and second individual contributions. Uh, volunteering does not come as a technical contribution. I mean, we see now and then people saying, you know, this person served as this, served as this, as one of his contributions, uh, which is not the case. It has to be a technical contribution. Um, so once you do this, you have to identify first what are the most impactful contributions that the nominee has uh, done. Uh, so you can collect and say these are the four or five contributions, technical contributions the nominee has, and then decide um, what kind of fellow category based on those technical contributions you want to um, assign or uh, you want to go for because each one is different, right? So you want to don't want to choose the wrong category because you can't provide the, the evidence for that particular category. And then um, choose the society or technical council uh, area. Again, this is also important because you don't want to, we have seen in some cases, people choose uh, different societies which are not a good fit for their expertise or uh, uh, things like that, which again, you know, draw back to them because uh, the societies may not have expertise to evaluate. And then choose one or two most impact, one, two most impactful contributions. Um, there, um, and of course, uh, if you are from industry, even for the uh, uh, university people, I guess is endorses can be uh, very useful because you know there is no restriction on fellow or uh, IEEE membership, so you can pick the right one who knows the nominee very well and can uh, provide the information. This is of course most underestimated tool because many people don't take endorses uh, seriously and they pick somebody arbitrarily who doesn't have good knowledge about uh, the nominee, or if they have good knowledge, they're not providing any added benefit to the nomination. So this is a chart that was provided in, uh, by uh, vice chair of the current fellow committee uh, to see. So there are various things you can provide, right, for impact and uh, evidence of impact, scholarly publications, patents, products and standardization, peer recognition, that is awards and things like that. Um, so depending on which category you are in, if you are in application engineering category, patents and products and services could be uh, the most important one expected out of your uh, nomination. And uh, citations uh, could be of your patents, could be uh, evidence of impact. Revenues could be evidence of the impact. Peer recognition, there's awards, and things like that, evidence of impact, and so on and so forth. Education, um, scholarly publications, but uh, addressing the uh, academic side of it, like you know, what kind of curriculum was developed, how this curriculum is different from the other one, what kind of new technique of teaching was developed, and those kind of things. Uh, patents, not expected, but if you have something related to EDU, could be good. Uh, products and services, not expected, but it could be useful if you have, again, related to the EDU side of it, and so on and so forth. Of course, peer recognition awards, that are related to educational things uh, will be good. Uh, same thing with the researchers. So publications are very important and peer recognition is very important. For technical leader, patents and products and services are important. Uh, so this chart can be useful to see in a way one need to fit in when the nomination is uh, submitted. Choosing references and endorses, um, they're highly valued, as you can see, you know, what they say also can contribute to your technical contributions because they are the experts in this field. And uh, so don't choose the references that do not know the nominee's work. Uh, arbitrarily, you know, don't ask somebody just because he's a fellow, he should be, he or she should be giving a reference. If they're not very familiar with the uh, uh, one, I you know, I can uh, have a, an example of, you know, I used to nominate people in the past and um, I, when I um, approached one um, uh, reference, he told me, see, it is not going to help you if I uh, write a reference. 
please find somebody. And I think that's one of the best advice he gave me because uh, if I had chosen, probably would have, I don't know what he would have written because he's not familiar with the nominee I was dealing with. First, you can choose references that collaborated with you and more often in the education side, the PhD supervisor, for example, could be a, a reference if he's a fellow, uh, but you know, not necessarily that you know you have to have everybody who collaborated with you. I think it helps if uh, some outside people who are also knowledgeable about the nominee's work and be able to provide a reference. Uh, similar thing helps with, uh, uh, works with the endorsers where they can write to the, um, uh, to strengthen the nominee's contributions with a verifiable evidence. This is a very critical in the industry because sometimes they're not published the financial data, for example, you can't find somewhere else, but if the, uh, the company um, um, official, I guess, saying um, this product sold so many places. This is part of the patent we licensed from this person, and our my our employee who created this patent, or so on and so forth. You know that cannot be verified somewhere else, but provided by a, a good authority in the company could be very useful, I guess, uh, in the impact and those kind of things. And um, one, I uh, don't want to go through again here. One thing I want to mention here is that one mistake, I, not mistake, I think maybe that is done because you know reference are chosen not carefully, is that most of the time they cut and paste from the nomination form. Same thing with the endorsers. That is a big no-no because um, uh, that doesn't, that represents that you know reference is not very serious about providing the reference. They have to write in their own words, what are the contributions those two things that are mentioned in the nomination, how the nominee has um, distinguished himself in those two contributions and what impact he has got in their own knowledge and those kind of things that can add value to the nomination. Same thing with the endorsers as well. Um, uh, so again, you know, they should not write a very generic statement that, you know, he is one of the best ones I've seen and those kind of things, which are not going to help. Uh, you have to you quantitative assessment of the nominee. Uh, some misconceptions, um, uh, which I said, you know, sometimes I also had way back. Uh, is there a quota for societies and technical councils? Uh, this is often, you know, people think that uh, because each technical council has so many members, they should be given so many uh, fellow uh, uh, elevations. Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, not unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, the way you look at it, all nominees are judged on their merit in respect of the society or technical council. So it doesn't matter, you know, technical council or the society may have few members, but if they have done good work and they could get many fellows elevated for their society. Um, is there a quota for each category, like application, linear, ADU, and those four, four categories? Again, here, no. Um, all are judged by their merit, but of course, depending on the category, the evidence is uh, the, the material, the nomination is uh, looked upon based on the evidence that is provided as per the uh, category, but not, you know, uh, there's no quota for each of them. Again, is there a quota for regions? Um, uh, again, there's no quota for regions. Again, you know, this is a, in a way, you know, meritorious thing, right? Where the merit wins, uh, in respect of where you are. And uh, so you could be any region, you could still get elevated as a fellow. Um, and the can uh, the society fellow evaluation committee, IEEE fellow committee members serve as nominators, references or endorsers. Again, this is a conflict of interest. So none of the society evaluation committees or the uh, fellow committee members, for example, myself, we are not expected, we're, we're not supposed to nominate or provide reference or endorse in anybody. If we do that, we have to excuse ourselves from the committee and not be a judge in the committee. Um, and also there's you no, know, the, all of us as a fellow committee members, including the society fellow committee members, they have to declare conflict of interest related to nominations that have potential conflict of interest, for example, family members, colleagues, associates and so on and so forth. Um, so this is some some of the things I found myself uh, in the past, so I put them here. And um, this is almost my last one, but one slide. Uh, 
all I presented here is available in these seven guides uh, that are available to everyone to read. Uh, there, you know, each one is, you know, 30 pages, 40 pages, and so on. So there's very detailed information on this process is provided, and um, you can find them at this website, and I'll send that to you through the chart once I'm done. And uh, second one, I uh, you can also find this that last year, uh, I think this also in relation to uh, Bangalore uh, section, I guess, uh, um, he is the past chair of the IEEE Fellows Committee, Stefano Gali. He gave a talk on, uh, more mainly focusing on the fellows from industry, but he also talks broadly about the process and it's also available on the uh, on the website I'm giving here. I'm going to provide this link as well to you once I'm done with my presentation. Uh, again, you know, this whatever I mentioned here is my own personal opinions and does not rep represent IEEE or my employer. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think we can take a few questions. First question is, uh, can the nominator can also serve as a reference? No. Nominator okay. cannot be a reference. Yeah. Okay, then other one is also the reference should be provided by the fellows only from the region or anywhere. It can be anywhere. It doesn't need to be a region. Okay, so then there's another question. How is the comparison of the technical achievements is done? Any yardstick as current topics may score over, say, some theoretical work? No, as I mentioned, you know, depending on which category you are in, let's say you are in the research category that is measured by your publications and things. So let's say you're in application engineering category, uh, the publications may mat still matter if they're available, but maybe less compared to let's say patents and other kind of things and your, uh, those type of, if a technical leader, again, patents may matter more, um, yeah. Then uh, next, I think the last question. So what degree of qualification is required to be elevated to fellow? Like, I mean, uh... Uh, percentage what you were show, showing excellent and 80 90 like some groups we have shown sir so like mm -hmm. how the merit you told i think already have answered to that that more than 60 percent is the criteria but can you put something some words on that sir they can score i mean about 60 percent they have this extremely qualified equal they are qualified and those mediumly the um, uh, those kind of categories there, but uh, when it comes to see, you have people who are, um, let's say, if you go to um, uh, Computer Society, there are more than 100 nominations. You will find 80 of them will be in this uh, 60 plus above. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to other ones where you have 30 nominations, you may find 10 of them maybe above this one. So you can't compare. Okay, this is qualified. This is not qualified. But when they come to the fellow committee, they look at all of them together as a whole. And um, also they take into consideration because some society can be more lenient, though they can't give the same score to everybody. They can't give you 100% to all the nominees. They have to have some kind of incremental one, but one can say, I can put 99.1 and 99.2, and I know you can put everybody above 90, right? So society, the, Fellow committee takes that into account, and maybe there are more lenient um, societies and there are more stricter societies, uh, and they put together some normalization process. So these are all, you know, looked upon equally to all of them. So there's another question uh, regarding nomination category statistics. Is data available on how many are successful per category, like A slash P? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So if we, um, uh, maybe I'll put that link as well. I showed on my uh, first presentation, first slide or a couple of slides uh, uh, earlier, uh, there's an Excel sheet they put in from 2015, 1999 to 2021 um, that you can download and see what are the nominations that are received, which category they have been, uh, which industry, I think, I don't think they put the category there, but in which industry, like, you know, from universities, from government and from uh, uh, industry, 
um, and how many are elevated for each of those categories. So next question is, uh, will research guided contributions considered? Um, I don't understand what that question. Research yes, guided I also, contributions. Uh, I also didn't understand. So, uh, okay. Maybe uh, then I'll take another question. So can a committee member nominate? No. no. Uh, none of the committee members. So what, what's happening, I guess, is some societies realizing that uh, not many nominations are coming from their society. Uh, they are actually forming what is called, like what your people are doing, right? The fellow identification and, and, and um, uh, nomination type of process. But uh, they have to be separate from the fellow committees who are evaluating them. They don't have to have any, they should not have any communication. Even if, let's say, this uh, committee that is formed to identify potential fellows recommends them to be nominated, but that should not influence the fellow committee on their society. This is the last question, sir. Will filed patents be considered? Yes, yeah, you could put them in there. It's just that uh, if, if they're filed but not approved, uh, we don't know whether they will be approved or not, right? So they may not be considered as uh, good as, so here again, it's a competition, right? It's not a, uh, uh, you pass up how if you get for uh, forty percent of the score. Uh, there's no pass score here. You are competing with other people. If there is somebody putting in patents that are issued and there are fifty of them, and you are competing with them with uh, file patents, even if there are fifty, the other person has much uh, what I call you know more advantage than uh, the file patent. So then, can I triple E chapter or sections nominate? No, no, but anybody can nominate, right? Uh, there doesn't need to be a fellow. It could be your colleague, you know, you can ask your colleague to nominate. If he, if they know your contributions well, they know you professionally well, and they can write a good nomination and uh, willing to spend the time because it's also, as you can see, takes good amount of time from the nominator to write the nomination, to pursue the references, pursue the endorsers. So if you can find somebody that can, but the, Section itself cannot nominate anybody. Okay. So I think with this, all the questions are over, sir. So I'd like to thank you for the talk and I'll ask, I request Chandrikant to give his word of thanks. Chandrikant. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, before I get into the vote of thanks, I have just one query I was trying to put into the chat box. So I'll take the liberty of asking directly. Yeah, sure. See, uh, can you advise on? Uh, uh, say, I have a good person whom I can. Uh, who I am confident about his decision. Mm -hmm. So, should I put him as a nominator or I, as a uh, reference or in the endorser? Which one you suggest to be best? No, you want to nominate somebody or you want to? No, no, I, I want to apply. So, I'll. Okay. I know I have a person who will be writing good and he knows me about everything. So I should use him as a nominator or the endorser or the reference. So three of them have different qualifications, right? Not qualification, I would say different criteria. For example,
aspect of this nomination process. And uh, as you know, all, we all Indian, as Puneet also mentioned, that we are a little skeptical about talking high about ourselves. But uh, as you told, it has to, the nomination uh, paper that, that has to communicate to the evaluator the, what you are. So uh, all of us, we have to start collecting the evidences. We have to uh, put them in proper place. That is one of the uh, big task, I guess, uh, we have to do maybe for a two, three, four, five, six months, depending on your area. So that is one of the- Also one question I have is that I put the links on the, in the chat window uh, on the, all the resources we have. I highly recommend, you know, people reading them, but though they may be a little bit, you know, it's like a reading a textbook, right? You've got 10 textbooks to read. You still have to read them. That's what I actually pull all my information from those material, but, you know, make in such a way that it's more like a teaching the process kind of thing. But I would recommend that uh, because that gives not only how to write the nomination, but also what happens. What are the, what are the judges looking for? And also in one of the, uh, uh, the documents, it also gives you sample nominations, how yeah. it should look like if you are going for a research category or uh, application in those kind of things. So uh, I do recommend yeah. that everybody read them before they embark on this. Yeah, yeah, that is absolutely the uh, purpose of this particular talk uh, uh, because you have now told, you have shown the glimpse of the thing, so now it will be easy for us to get into the detail. And the, as uh, you told, we have downloaded the things and I have started going through for my personal interest. It's not that everybody should do that. Uh, so, and hey, thank you once again, as I will mention that because uh, uh, apart from your regular duty, you come to our help in every uh, now and then we request you in your different capacities, technical capacities. This is professional upgradation capacity. And sometimes you'll be giving some small tips about some of the things also. So we are, uh, we consider ourselves very fortunate to have you whenever we require. And thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. Uh, though we are not able to meet you physically, but we are eagerly looking to get you in India so that we can have you in closer interaction. And uh, now I'll request, uh, I'll go back to our uh, chapter uh, and show uh, APMTT is, uh, Society joint chapter. Uh, Mr. Puneet Kumar Mishra, he is very enthusiastic in organizing all this sort of. Uh, activities and he has initiated this one and he told you please go ahead you get Dr. Reddy and you please have it and uh, Dr. Bindu Madhava, uh, chair of our Bangalore section dynamic leader and uh, he also moment I propose he told yes it has to be done I'll be there and he was there from the beginning and you can thank both of uh, them for being present here and uh, being part of this talk. And uh, uh, Ashutosh, uh, when I when we discussed in our exit committee, this has to be done. He spontaneously took the responsibility. Okay, I know CJ sir, so I'll get in touch with him. And he took the uh, all the pain or all the fun, rather contacting you, not the pain. I I am sorry, all the fun of uh, talking to you and engaging you in this. So that he took the. Uh, responsibility. Thank you, Ashutosh. And in the background, uh, our Changappa and uh, Kishore Kumar, they are all publicizing, they are all uh, supporting this particular event in terms of electronic media support and public uh, propagating this message. And we have a wonderful audience throughout. So thank uh, them also. And uh, Towards the, uh, this one, uh, we had some 45 odd participants throughout the session. We thank you all and we wish that you'll be able to uh, mold your mind, how to, uh, uh, how to put your contribution into real, in the black and white. It is not that it, it has to be only perceived, it has to be in the black and white. So you, I think, I think that you must have got a clue out of it, how to, Proceed with your uh, this one, professional upgradation in this uh, IEEE this one. Uh, so we thank you also for participating and interacting actively uh, for this uh, uh, beautiful event that Bangalore section conducts every uh, year. And this time APMTT the chapter uh, pitched in in organizing this one. 
So thank you all. And with this, uh, we are uh, closing the uh, today's session. And once again, thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Reddy. Looking forward to have you in India very soon. Thank you and all the best for all your efforts. I think we are all embarking on this one today. So, <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.